Hello, I'm Bob. Uh, okay, so I think this is the part where you can ask questions, and I will say, oh my god, you're the smart ones, you tell me. <laughs> Question. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay. uh, we, so yeah, hiring so is... We're going to set. have um, you repeat that question so everybody can hear. Uh, so I looked at democrats.org slash jobs, yeah. and I noticed that there were no security postings. What can we do about that, or do I just email you directly? Yeah, so you can email me. Uh, so we have uh, filled the, the roles that we have, but obviously, um, so interesting factoid, like the DNC is roughly 200 people. I forget what the real number is. Um, if you think about the combined organization that I left, which was AOL plus Yahoo, that's almost as big. Those security people, that, that team is almost the same size as all of the DNC. So I'm never going to get the funding to go hire another 10 people. Like it's just not going to happen. So what we have to figure out is how to, to fill this role. So a lot of people have said, I'd like to volunteer. And up till recently, we haven't, um, we haven't had enough of the right foundation in place with the right permanent people in order to take advantage of people who wanted to volunteer. Um, and now some people may just want to quit their jobs and help, and there may be places where I can help you all. So, you know, tweet at me and I'll send you my email address. Um, but it's, it's an interesting thing where, you know, a lot of people said, uh, oh, I want to I wanna volunteer a few hours here and there and do X, Y, and Z. But if you don't have the foundation, it's really hard. And part of the foundation is, like I said, there's people, process, and technology. So a lot of what we have to do is work with the various teams, and that means getting to know the teams and what is their history, where is their technical debt, where is their process debt. Um, and, and all of that just takes a lot of time. So we haven't been in the place where there has been a shepherd who could then say, okay, you're the expert in this thing. Go, right? So, uh, so we can't have like 20 people just coming, you know, logging in and just trying to help, that, that wouldn't actually help. That would, that would slow things down. Uh, sort of like Mythical Man Month, are you familiar with that book? Oh, so it's a good book. Anybody read that book? Mythical Man Month, oh, it's a classic. It's, it's a short read. Um, the you know, quick summary there is um, you know, um, adding people slows you down. It doesn't speed you up. But it has other benefits. Um, so I feel like we're kind of in that position now. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear from more people who would like to help and in, in what way they'd like to help. And as we get further into the election cycle, as we go from two dozen um, candidates to a smaller number, those uh, opportunities may um, appear a little bit more clearly than, than they are today. Two dozen is, is a little bit rough. But having said that, if there's a candidate that you know, uh, you know, I would never stop you from reaching out to the candidate and uh, to the campaign and saying, like, I can do this. But I also, you know, hopefully that came through in the, in the talk. A lot of the stuff that really needs to get done is some foundational, real basic stuff. And uh, so I just, you know, want people to understand, like, you may be giving the talk on malware reverse engineering and you've got new techniques and a new code base that you're releasing open source today. And we really need you to help figure out why uh, my password doesn't work for the database. Like, that's just the practical reality of dealing with non-technical organizations that are distributed. Uh, that's, that's kind of the challenge that, that we're up against. It's, it's a good challenge, but it's a little bit, it's a little bit rough. All right, so again, for anybody who Thank wasn't you. here, I'm going to set this microphone right here. If you have a question, come on up, ask your question on the mic, then put it down and take your answer, OK? Good morning. Um, I sent you a note on idlord.com about uh, volunteering. You answered some of those questions in your presentation. Okay. Um, I mentioned uh, uh, Maciej Sig Siglowski's uh, yeah. site, and for anybody who doesn't know, uh, he's got a couple of essays on working on a campaign. It's very good. It's idlewords.com. You mentioned that uh, DigiDems, and, and Mr. Siglowski does as well, you mentioned that they hired 81 people for 2018. Yeah. There's 435 House seats. There's yep. 33 or 34 Senate seats. There's 50 states. And so yep. it seems like there's a disconnect there. I'm, um, I'm a semi-retired IT professional. I've got time, but mm -hmm. and I can volunteer locally, and I will right. do that. But I've got a lot more cycles than uh, the local campaigns are going to, to consume. So right. how, do we, how do we match up? 
the people that have the time right. and this apparent disconnect between the number of people available and the number of needs that are out there. Yeah, uh, so that's, that's a great observation. Um, so I, you know, I don't run the Digidem, so I can't really speak for them, um, but obviously finite resources mean, you know, finite number of campaigns. And so, uh, you know, I think we're really counting on the people who within that community are thinking about which are the battleground states, which are the highest priority ones, that they're going to be doing a good job of that. Again, uh, I majored in political science, but I'm not going to be the person to say which, which states are the most important states for people to place these resources in. I'm going to let people who, who have done that multiple times do that. So I think it's really a matter of resource allocation. Um, and then groups like uh, Ragtag uh, actually do have a, a process where you can uh, apply to be a, a Ragtag volunteer, and they'll do their best to hook you up with, with various campaigns. That's a partial solution, but there's no, there's no one correct solution. So when I said I really want people to think about, um, j you know, just keep trying, uh, you know, I, I talked to a few people who applied to the DNC. It's like, ah, we have so few roles. Like, it has to be a really, really strong match. Otherwise, you know, I, I can't bring you on. Uh, I don't have 150, 200, you know, heads. Uh, so, you know, we have to we have to hire very carefully. But I, I tell them like, I don't want you to be discouraged. This is one way that you can contribute. There are a thousand others. I only know of a few of them. Uh, so to keep looking. And so part of the answer is, and I'll, I'll reply to your, to your mail at some point uh, when I can get caught up, um, but I really want people to make it a project to keep looking. It's not like, you know, you strike out once and you're done. Like, continue to try. This is messy and it's organic. And whatever you come up with will be obvious in retrospect. Uh, but I can't, I can't predict what that will be for you and for the organization you end up uh, uh, protecting. Um, so just, just keep trying, please. We need, we need more people to do that sort of thing. So thank, thank you for the work you've already done. Yep, jump on in. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm Jack. Um, first of all, I, I guess thank you for, for what you do because I think uh, InfoSec pros leaving Silicon Valley and working for the civil society side of things is really important. The only way this, start, this starts to change. So I don't know if anyone tells you that, but thank you. So um, what sort of outreach? I, I was pleasantly surprised by how, mu how much outreach occurs to support the campaigns like that, Digidems, but once like the, uh, the Blue Wave's in office, what's being done at the state and local level or anything in terms of that similar support. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so um, so again, we so it's very interesting. You know, when I when I started, it was obvious that I had to work to protect the um, the DNC. And the other interesting thing about working in my role is I don't have to be coy with anybody about the hand I was dealt. It's a subject of you know books and articles and, and things like that. So. Um, We've been working really hard to continue to evolve, modernize a lot of systems, try to cut technical debt. But uh, not long after I started, uh, got my sea legs, then Tom Perez is the chair, made sure I understood that helping the state parties was going to be a very high leverage thing. Um, and so not just protecting them, but giving them some of the tools to be able to help campaigns as they were starting. Again, there's, you know, uh, how many campaigns are there in any, uh, any major year? Like, like a bajillion. Um, up and down the ballot. So it's not just the presidentials that we're worried about. I mean, you know, all the way down to school board, that, that kind of thing. So um, the, the trick for us is to try to figure out how to be high leverage. And so we did a lot of that work in the midterms. But again, I was just kind of guessing, like, maybe people will want a webinar on, you know, doing this. Like, maybe we bring in the social media companies and have them do a webinar. I don't know. We're making this stuff as, as we go along. And then we took the stuff that we thought resonated with people, and, and then we've really polished that. So um, we've been really pushing uh, not just the presidential campaigns, but we've gone back, and now we're cycling through all of the presentations, making sure the state parties are aware of this. We now have email blasts that we send out. I didn't have time to talk about this, but we also have this uh, email list that we send out to them to say, if you see anything that's suspicious, please let us know, even if you've dealt with it, even if you've resolved it, even if it was nothing, send us a note so that we can then think about that in the broader context. Lo and behold, a bunch of people then send out a thing saying, ah, this is nothing, but we had this thing. Like, oh, well, a bunch of campaigns are having this thing. Yeah, weird call from Russia, that's weird, okay. The second campaign or state with, oh, second, well, okay. So now you start to see a pattern that they, not, they never would have seen. And so we're trying to build up um, uh, you know, a federation of, of, of people who are involved and know how to start asking some of the right questions. I try to respond personally to as many of these, these alerts as I can get, even, I mean, sometimes, I mean, you can probably guess that sometimes I get, they send me their spam, 
Like, I don't need this, that's okay. It, it's suspicious, I, yeah, but they're just trying to sell you, you know, whatever. Um, and so I try to teach them, you know, what it is that I look for um, and try to build up that confidence so that when something bad happens, they really do rope us in. So again, is, is that like an ironclad strategy with clear deliverables and results? No, but we're, we're trying to take, uh, take into account that this is a messy, organic uh, system and that we, we have to start infusing it as best we can. So working with some of these partners is gonna help, but um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's messy. And I'll just, just tell you, like, it's messy and it's organic. And, and uh, you know, the things that I will tell you next year that worked or didn't work will probably surprise me. Like, I think I know what's going to happen. And I, the one thing I've learned in this job is I will be surprised. Uh, how do you manage candidates that don't prioritize their own personal security, like their own Facebook accounts or whatever they've had up? You've had done set something up in this space. What? Tell me your background. Uh, uh, like working in a corporate environment and some really awkward executives that uh, might not want to have their own. So your hypothesis is that, like, senior people in a campaign would kind of have some of the same behaviors as senior people in a organization. In a, in a corporation. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, that's an interesting, interesting <laughs> theory. Um, so. Again, uh, I don't have agents on everybody's machines, so I, I can't uh, I can't tell for sure. But we do, you know, we do try to lean in a little bit. So I, you know, it's it's like I'm your, I'm the personal trainer for the for the campaigns and for the state parties. And you know, your personal trainer is going to tell you to eat right and don't drink too much and stop smoking and all that stuff. Um, and so I have to find a way to explain, to sort of like let them understand I'm here for you. Uh, I'm going to give you the same message over and over again because eating right and you know exercise it's, it's kind of what you have to do. I don't know any any shortcuts, um, but I want to build credibility with them uh, so that I can occasionally you know lean in to to figure out what's really going on um, to build that trust so they know I'm not going to narc on them. I'm not going to share information between parties between campaigns. Like you know we we have you know very strict confident confidentiality rules. So. Um, so the good news is that we have some good evidence that the, the senior people are taking it seriously. And I don't know if that's, I, I'm not going to take credit for that. It may simply be the climate. It may simply be that there are, you know, Mueller reports that come out that happen to pertain to this space and you don't have that in the industry that you work in. Um, so again, when I, when I said I wanted to tell you the Yahoo story, even though it's all public, most people don't know it, and telling these larger stories is actually part of that. And so it may be that they're more sensitized. I, I'm not really sure. But, um, but yeah, working with very busy people is very hard. Um, but we, we work with um, we work the, a security um, person. We have a point of contact. Um, that's, so we have the top 10 things you need to do to run a secure, or, uh, secure organization. Number one is have somebody in charge. And so for each of the campaigns, we have somebody who's in charge that we can work with. And it doesn't have to be somebody who's a cybersecurity expert. It can simply be a really great uh, project manager who can then go around and make sure that all of the stuff gets done. Um, and so, uh, so far, so good. But uh, again, I, I, can't, I can't see everything because they're not remote offices and, and I'm not headquarters. But so far, so good. Five minutes? OK. Uh, next question. I have a question about data accumul <clears throat> excuse me about data accumulation by campaigns. Um, and it's kind of a big question. Uh, uh, say it again, about what? Uh, data, data accumulation by yep. campaigns. Yep. So it's kind of a big question, and I'll try and keep it as succinct as I can, but it's not my strong point. Um, it seems like there's a lot of election tech springing up um, which revolves around political parties and campaigns accumulating as much data as they can yeah. on electors so that they can target them as best they can. Seems to happen on, on all sides of politics. Um, and I just wonder, as a, as a trend, um, collecting huge amounts of data, cross-referencing it with other um, data sets, is it something that causes you any concern in terms of that being a potential, uh, well, a lot of data that will be obtained by someone who shouldn't get it in the end? Yeah, so thanks for that. So. Um so, so one of the things that I've noticed is that there's, um, so yes, obviously I'm a security guy, I'm concerned about everything. So you know, if, if you ask me, if, if, Bob, are you concerned about something? Of course. Um, so uh, a lot of the data is actually public data. Um, and that's not widely known. And so you know, we sometimes have a mismatch between what, what is actually 
private and, and what is not, and what people's expectation is. Um, not usually. I mean, you, you generally speaking know that when you go in and, and fill out a, uh, a form to register to vote, that that information is used in a certain way and it's given to political parties. Uh, but sometimes there's a little bit of a disconnect there. Um, but yeah, I think uh, we, we continue to need to uh, evolve our thinking in terms of what is PII. I mean, think about this for, you know, the notion of public has really changed without us having language over the last several uh, last you know since the advent of the internet we haven't really kept up with our mental models so it used to be that if you wanted to know how much i paid for my house you could fly to san francisco you could go to city hall between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. you know modulo like you know holidays or people feeling like they didn't want to work that day so you could go figure it out you could just ask them um, but now we have a world in which you can go figure that out before I exit the door. And it's public information, but those seem very different to me. And so I think there's this larger conversation around what is, what is public, what is not, uh, that we have, and we don't have the language really to deal with that. So, um, uh, but, but point taken, yeah. Oh, sure. And then I think we have one last, one last question. Um, what I was thinking of is, is there's, um, there seems to be kind of an explosion of kind of canvassing recording apps. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if, um, if, a, if I go and knock on your door and I say, are you planning on voting for candidate A, B or C? Then I will then, after you give me the answer to that question, just one person to another, I'll go and enter that into, into some of these apps. Yeah. And so we've got a sort of a situation where there's potentially uh, kind of an arms race, I guess, um, between Dems and Republicans where we might all agree that, that that's information that might not be public, but, but, but I've given it to, to a stranger. Um, but maybe, maybe we shouldn't be accumulating it, but then at the, on, the other, on the other hand, we've got both parties right. uh, want to accumulate that information, and right. neither one probably wants to be the one who says, well, we'll accumulate yeah, less. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's obviously a far more nuanced uh, conversation uh, that would have to involve people who actually do the data analytics and the collection and the, you know, the, the enrichment of all that stuff. Um, you as a as a person who's told somebody who knocks on your door or somebody who calls you or texts you, telling them that uh, you, you don't plan to vote for this candidate or you're not a Democrat um, is actually valuable information because it means we'll stop bugging you. So I think it's, you know, it kind of works, it kind of works both ways. So the last thing you want is every campaign to constantly call you uh, because there's no predictive analytics around whether or not you're going to be amenable to having the conversation. So again, I'm not the data analyst. Uh, you, you know, I, I don't even play one on TV, to be honest with you. But I think it's one of these things where um, there, are, there are some real benefits to collecting and, and sharing that information. Um, but you're absolutely right. Um, this, this, is a, this is a new world of, of data. And uh, obviously, there have been some high profile events around data acquisition and manipulation. So yeah, I think we, we have to continue to be vigilant. OK, last question, if any. I think they want you to go to the microphone. It's exciting. So I hear you have like a really awesome vintage crypto collection. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. This is true. What do you have in your collection, sir? Um, so uh, I started collecting um, back at Netscape, which was the company that made a $35 browser. And uh, so I, I started collecting. Uh, my first item was a, um, it's called an M209, um, which is an old uh, army device, um, many of which were made by the Smith Corona Corporation. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because you need the kind of skills to build, uh, design, and, and, and roll out something that is a mechanical device. Um, so it has little cipher wheels, and you can encrypt and decrypt. And I was just fascinated by this. One of the things I really like about it, now that you ask, and none of you care a damn about this, but one of the things I like about it is when you, when you encrypt, the cipher text is, is put into blocks of five characters and then a space in five characters. And I thought, well, that's weird. It must be a bug. And then I started researching this, and I was like, no, it's not a bug. You need to now give this to the teletype guy who's going to then wire, the, wire this via Morse code. And it's just easier than a, just a long string of characters. So you break it up. But when you decrypt it, it doesn't do that. It actually now looks like regular English text. They put this into hardware. Like, what? That's crazy difficult. And there's all sorts of little, little flourishes on the thing. So I got the bug. Uh, and I, I fell in with a, a group of uh, misfit uh, crypto collectors. Um, 
and uh, just started buying a few other things here and there. Um, and to answer the obvious question, yes, I have an Enigma. <laughs> so, I know you're all wondering, do you have an Enigma? Um, okay, I think that's it. So thank you all. Thank you for coming. I'm so honored. I'm really, really, thank you. And please, please, please find a way to contribute. Don't let me do this alone. <laughs>